Little Metro Police Department Public Integrity Unit. This is official statement. Reference case number 14. Can you please state your name for the record? This will be a recorded statement. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I seized the money because I thought it was fruits of a drug crime. They took my money and said that I can't get it back. How much cash was in that center console? $6,000. How much money do you think we got here? Probably about twenty thousand. It was anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars that day. It was gone. Was that amount of money ever returned to you? No, sir. We never talked about the money that went missing. It's not reported in the judicial system, and it's not reported in the Louisville Metro's police ledgers as well. So that money is gone. It's no secret that these guys are pretty good about sticking money in their pocket. Now, prior to putting the money into those bags, did you take any money that did not belong to you for your personal gain? I did not. They could do whatever they want, when they want, how they want. All I know is that they stole $10,000. They don't let them just steal from me. I was just laying on the couch and they came and I thought it was maybe the neighbors. And uh, I just heard some something slide across the porch. And when I heard that, I happened to look up and I didn't see nobody. And then uh, I heard somebody announce SWAT and he just started knocking out the glass. Demetrius Allison was home with his three young kids when police showed up at his door with a search warrant. So I ran downstairs, went and got my daughters brought them upstairs. As soon as I opened the door, he said, put your hands up. And when I put my hands up, he hit me in my face with the butt of his gun. They was just beating me. They was just giving it to me. Knee in my back, they whooped me pretty bad. The officers justified Allison's injuries, which included a fractured orbital bone, by saying he was resisting arrest. What was it like for your kids? Oh, they're terrified. They're still terrified to this day of police. They see police, they get nervous. And best believe, my kids, they remember that day. They remember it to the T. Kids, even though they kids, they see things. The property voucher shows the detective seized a small amount of cocaine. But that wasn't all that was taken. What's going on? Once they detained me, they got me outside. I was handcuffed on the stretcher. I would just talk to the neighbor and I was asking if she could get the money out of my pocket for rent to give to my kid's mother. And next thing you know, one of the detectives came from behind me and uh, he reached in my pocket and took the money out. How much money was it? In between 8,500 and like 10,000, something like that. But detectives only turned in about $1,600, which would leave several thousand unaccounted for. Allison sued the department for excessive force. The lawsuit is still ongoing. All that pain, all that trauma to get basically nothing. Did the money ever come up again? Did you, did you try to bring it up or try to get it back? At that point, it didn't even matter. My defense lawyer, anytime I mentioned anything about that, he was just like, I need to worry about getting out of jail. I don't need to worry about any of that. I knew from when they took the money from me, I wasn't going to get that money back. I knew that. But I didn't think that they would not report it. In raids like the one executed on Allison's home, narcotics detectives are given a wide latitude to destroy property and use force, all in the name of seizing drugs and money. While the department has proudly displayed the contraband taken in these raids as proof that they're fighting crime, what actually happens when they're carried out is largely kept secret. A Vice News investigation has identified an alarming pattern of largely unchecked abuses within the department's narcotics unit, 
which for years has used residential search warrants to target Louisville's West End, where the vast majority of the city's black community lives. Over the past 18 months, we've reviewed thousands of search warrants, obtained hundreds of previously unreleased documents and hours of footage, and spoken to dozens of people on both sides of these raids, including targets, narcotics officers, and their confidential informants. LMPD has maintained that its long-held practice of investigating its own officers works and insisted that complaints of corruption are fabricated. But our findings suggest narcotics officers have been allowed to operate with almost no oversight, raiding people's homes with little or no information and under-reporting what they seize in the process. Yo, hop out here real quick, boy. Can you give her my money in my pocket, though? Uh, man, I I'm just gonna... cashed my check. Before we did that, I would say yes, but our policy says you cannot transfer money from one person to another after being arrested. Police departments like Louisville's seize money and drugs legally all the time. It's called asset forfeiture, and many law enforcement agencies rely on it to fund their own departments. The practice took hold in the 1980s as part of a sweeping legislative action in the so-called War on Drugs. The Comprehensive Crime Control Act is the only real chance at doing something constructive about criminal law reform. One reform would widen the powers of federal prosecutors to go after mobsters and drug traffickers by seizing their profits. It could be a knockout blow against the drug syndicates that are poisoning our country. Why should any right-minded person oppose this? For the first time, local police departments were allowed to take a cut of any assets seized under federal law. States swooped in and followed with their own asset forfeiture laws. Over the past decade, LMPD has seized at least $31 million. The county has kept about $8 million of that, split between the police department and the prosecutor's office. Criminologist Peter Kraska has been monitoring departments' increasing reliance on asset forfeiture and the aggressive policing that comes with it. The police are now incentivized to go in and proactively extract cash from those communities. And that just builds in an element of abuse and potential corruption. VIPER, it stands for Violent Incident Prevention, Enforcement and Response. For three years now, the LMPD Special Unit has racked up arrests, cracked down on guns and drugs. Specialized units have become the front lines of police crime control efforts. Members typically don't wear uniforms and drive unmarked cars. Police chiefs and administrators have been told for 35 years, go out and do proactive policing. And so these teams begin to be looked at as the elite crime-fighting units. Having that status gives them a lot more latitude in the department to do what they need to do to effectively fight crime. And that's a really seductive message in policing. The idea is to be fast, flexible, and be in a position that we can do what we need to do to make local safe. These specialized units have been lauded all across the country, but they've also been the source of frequent scandals. If you look at the history of elite drug control units, they more often than not devolve into some form of mild or serious corruption. Are these specific to certain police departments or regions, or is this something that you see anywhere that these, these units are employed? This is absolutely widespread. Back, 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 stop. At LMPD, specialized drug units have been responsible for executing most search warrants on homes. How hard is it in practice to get a search warrant? Theoretically and technically, it should be a tough process. Pragmatically and practically in the field, it's devolved into just a, uh, a bureaucratic routine. A review of thousands of LMPD search warrants carried out between 2017 and 2020 uncovered a widespread use of boilerplate affidavits, which regularly cite little more than a tip from a confidential informant. It's common practice to allow for knock and announce search warrants on very thin evidence. And that technically should be a violation of the Fourth Amendment. It's rarely looked at in that sort of way. Keep 
please state your name for the record? Detective Richard Weedo. Brian Bailey. Court depositions and internal investigations obtained by Vice News give a glimpse into the latitude these units are given. Okay, and in what position are you? Narcotics detective. CID, Criminal Interdiction Unit, yeah. Well, well that, no, that, that's narcotics. That was the new name of narcotics. Does anyone in your unit wear body camera? I'm not working in narcotics. For years, narcotics officers rarely used body cameras, even though they were technically supposed to. I've been a part of a thousand search warrants in my life, and I don't think we've ever taken a video. It's my understanding that our internal narcotics, narcotics policy we don't have to worry about. Are you aware of anything in the narcotics policy that exempts you from having to use a, a body camera if it's assigned to you? I don't have that policy in front of me, but I would say there are exemptions. Yes, there are. There would have to be. You don't, you don't know what it is. You just think there has to be one. There has to be one. There's sort of this double bind of secrecy um, within elite crime control units. We have to be secret. We're potentially busting high-level drug dealers. But unfortunately, what that devolves into are those units thinking that they're infallible, that nobody needs to know what they're up to. And that's a really dangerous place for a police department to get into, particularly when you're talking about a wide amount of discretion for taking somebody's cash. There's no real oversight when officers seize money on scene. Louisville's policy is that officers don't count the money at all. It's put in a bag and handed into the property room where it sometimes isn't counted until days later. It makes no sense from a point of view of police accountability. Why did that come about? Who didn't want that money to be counted on scene and have several people video document what was happening? Sources inside the police department told us this policy came about after several instances where the money that made it back to the property room didn't match what was counted on scene. If you feel infallible, then if you run into, let's say, $10,000 cash, it's a really slippery slope to get to a point where you say, so what if we turn in eight? It's a drug dealer's word against ours. Over the course of our reporting, we spoke to roughly two dozen people who told us that police seized more money then they turned into the property room. They took my money and said that I can't get it back. It was just a bunch of money saved up in a jug. Anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred. They said that they took only five hundred sixty-six dollars. No, they didn't. I didn't get to see what they did. I know it was over five hundred dollars. Here it says on the inventory form that they took U.S. currency, but then it's crossed out and it says currency was returned to owner. Yeah, that's a lie. Were you aware that they didn't list taking any money from you? First time I've heard that. I wasn't aware of that. Does that surprise you? I mean, that surprised me with them. In some of these instances, officers reported less money than was allegedly seized. But in most, no money was reported at all, which is surprising given the broad discretion officers have to take any cash they think might be connected to drugs. When we reviewed all unsealed narcotic search warrants over a four-year period, we found that at LMPD, officers reported finding no money two-thirds of the time. Multiple former narcotics officers, some of whom worked at LMPD, told us they didn't understand how that could be possible. The detective Demetrius Allison remembers taking his money is the same one who wrote the warrant, Richard Weedo. He, like most other LMPD narcotics officers, relied heavily on confidential informants. CIs have a unique perspective on narcotics policing because they interact with both the police and the people they go after. One of Weedo's former informants agreed to sit down with us for an interview. I was doing undercover buys on narcotics, handguns, wearing wires and stuff. Pretty much anything that paid me and that they wanted me to do, I was doing for them. The CI, whose identity we agreed to protect for their safety, worked with Weedo as recently as 2020, 
and became familiar with other narcotics officers in his unit. How would you describe that group of officers? At first, you know, I, I described them as, you know, pretty nice, honest people, but through the transaction and years, I found out, you know, that they were crooked people. When you say crooked people, what do you mean? Like keeping drugs, keeping money, and stuff that they seized off of the defendants. They would tell me when they go and do these busts that, like, let's just say four of them go in to do it, everybody gets money split equally. The most that I've ever seen them get was $500,000. Did Weedo ever tell you that he had kept money? Yes, he said when they hit this house one time, that's how I knew about the $500,000, that they split most of the money amongst themselves. So they only reported some of the $500,000? I don't know if any of it got reported. And these guys are taking a lot of money off the streets, and they don't have to count it. And people are saying it's not getting turned in, so where's it going? LMPD declined to answer questions or to make Detective Weedo or any other officer available for comment, citing pending litigation. With search warrants specifically, how much are they relying on you? Usually when they're supposed to get search warrants, they got to do buys, at least a few buys at a resident. Like say I, I bought marijuana out of your house, we're gonna do a couple buys so that they can see that it's actually coming from you and then they'll go get a judge to sign off on the warrant, but that's not how it always happens. The CI said they were aware of multiple times when officers searched people's homes before they'd gotten a judge's permission to do so. But even a legal warrant doesn't require much to get a judge's signature. In a 2015 study, based on dozens of ride-alongs with LMPD narcotics detectives, officers acknowledged that it didn't take much to get into someone's home, especially given how, as one detective put it, no one cares about these people. Our review of LMPD search warrants identified several times in which judges had signed off on suspicious warrants submitted by Weedo and his colleagues. One of the clearest patterns is using almost identical affidavits to hit the same home twice over the course of as little as a month. In some cases, the language was so similar it even included the same typos. Many of those affidavits were written by Brian Bailey, who for years served more warrants than any other LMPD detective. One of Bailey's former informants told us officers would pick out a target and then use informants to justify a raid, even when they didn't actually have any intel. This same CI told us they knew of multiple people Bailey had taken large amounts of money from. I wasn't even there when the raid went down. I'd been a, at a friend of mine's. So I'm at his house and we're talking and all of a sudden my phone starts going off. He says, this is Officer Brian Bailey with LMPD. Just want to let you know, we raided your place at uh, 29th Street. When I get back to the house, <laughs> of course, I knew something you know, was wrong. My back gate was busted open. You know, I was just destroyed. Stuff I was looking for, of course, was gone. Joe Wimsat was dealing drugs at the time and kept his stash and money at his house. How much money did they take? <laughs> Quite a bit. It was anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars that day that it was gone. This is the property voucher. So this is what was turned into the evidence room, and it doesn't say fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. It it just says a thousand three hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> One thousand three hundred. Well, that doesn't surprise me. It's no secret that these guys are pretty good about sticking money in their pocket. I can tell you, the, the methamphetamine is probably close. Now, the cocaine part here, there should have been five ounces of cocaine. They've got 67.1. I know for a fact that's not right. That's not That's that's not right at all. So it's 20, 28 grams in an ounce? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. So if you had five, that... Five ounces, five times 28. We're talking, that, that's about half. That's, grams, I think. that's less than half of what you said that you had. Pretty bad, pretty big difference in, compared to what I had and what's on here. <laughs> but the thought of filing a complaint for the missing cocaine was laughable. I'm not going to put more on me than, you know, what they've charged me with. Oh, well, yeah, by the way, y'all's missing this much. <laughs> we might have went from doing the five years that I got to, you know, a whole lot more. The plea agreement that I agreed to was actually, um, in my opinion, was a gift. 
Local defense attorneys who people call after their homes are targeted are pretty familiar with these types of plea agreements and the things that never make it into the public record because of them. Brendan McLeod is one of the many lawyers who described the prevalence of missing money as an open secret in the Louisville justice system. These are clients that I know and I can vouch for them. The people that I'm saying that $80,000 is gone, I know it was. And that's happened more than once. How many times would you say there's been a discrepancy in a case that you've, you've worked on? More than my hands and toes. It happens more often than it ever should. So uh, you're representing someone, they tell you that there's a discrepancy, small, enormous, $80,000, what do you do? They don't like that the money's gone. But if in their mind it reflects a more favorable disposition, then they don't care. They can sweeten it down the line, get it dismissed or get it something where it's not gonna be on my record. And, you know, everyone's walks away. And the money just... The money is uh, it was usually chalked up as a cost of doing business. But that money, just to be clear, that's not money that's going to the police department, to the district attorney's office. It's not reported in the, in the judicial system, and it's not reported in the Louisville Metro's police um, ledgers as well. So that money is gone. Have you worked any cases that have involved discrepancies in the amount of drugs reported? I've had drugs not reported at all. And the thing is about money, most people know how much money they have. When they have dope, they know exactly how much it is. I mean, wh where's that going? Well, it's probably it goes the way of the, the money. And usually my clients are, are ecstatic when that's gone. Multiple people have told us that officers seize drugs for their own purposes, including Wido's former confidential informant. He also said he'd been asked to plant drugs. There were a few times, and then one time they wanted me to plant drugs to help them with a case. They were going to pay me to do it. How much were they going to pay you? They said 10 grand. I don't know where the money was going to come at. At first, I was going to do it, but then I thought about it, and I backed out at the end of it. Others have alleged that officers planted drugs on them, including one woman who testified to it in a civil case against Brian Bailey. Another woman told LMPD investigators that Bailey had given her heroin to use. When police interactions happen in the dark, officers have near total control over the narrative. How much power do these detectives have in dictating the terms of a plea deal or, or the outcome of some of these cases? They're very inf influential. I mean, they, they can change the plea. Everyone used to say, um, it's good to know the prosecutor, it's best to know the judge. In all reality, the most powerful person out there is the officer. He can ignore a crime, he can charge you with something. There's nothing more powerful than the discretion of a police officer out there. I mean, that, that's no doubt. And it's a real danger when a cop knows that power, when they, when they understand that. Hey, this is Hankerson 658. What is your name? In May of 2014, Mike Jackson was at a gas station in Louisville and he was stopped by Detective Brett Hankison. All of a sudden, this guy jumps out of trucks. He showed me that he was a police officer. He said, I'm not arresting you or nothing like that. I'm just detaining you. I said, detaining me for what? And he said, I'm just detaining you. I said, for what? You're just being detained right now for investigation, okay? Hankison suspected Jackson had just sold drugs to a woman in the back of a cab. Jackson insisted there was no drug deal. He said, I'm just detaining you. You don't mind if I search your vehicle? I said, yeah, go ahead. You know, it doesn't matter if I search my vehicle for what? And he never ever said what he was detaining me for. In the car, they found a tiny bit of weed and a lot of money. I'm thinking to myself, this is fishy. And he just stood there and stared at the money for a minute and looked at me and he just kept looking. And I could tell he was formulating an idea of uh, how he's going to Get some of it. Took me Where did all this? How much money do you think we got here? Probably about twenty thousand. What do you care not money around your rental car in the trunk for? And I was planning on Monday, you know, to take it to the bank. But that's that's my lot, lot, lot of saving. You talking about probably eight or nine months of saving? I told him I said I'm a barber. I said this is money I've been saving for a while. I'm not accusing you of smoking nothing. I don't smoke. I don't sell drugs. I'm accusing you of possessing it. I don't sell drugs. 
Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I'm selling drugs. I was black with some money, you know, and I fit the profile. I qualified, I guess, as being a drug dealer. Hankison seized all of the cash and ended up charging Jackson for trafficking marijuana. Jackson was already confused by the charge. And then he learned Hankison had only reported seizing about $14,000. I went down to Internal Affairs and I told them, this man put all these fake charges on me. I didn't do anything. He stole money from me. It's your statement that you had approximately $24,000. $24, and I will tell you that the amount entered was $14,010. It's not correct. They took some money out of that money. It quickly became clear that it was virtually impossible to prove how much money Jackson actually had. So it was his word against the word of a bunch of officers who wasted no time attacking Jackson's credibility. I guess the only thing is obviously this guy's credibility, which, you know, I think everybody at this table knows is in question. I mean, is this all a matter of, uh, you know, of him trying to, to get out of the situation rather than, you know, face the, the charges? But there were several reasons to question Hankison's account, including a moment captured in one of the recordings documenting the arrest that Hankison provided to investigators. Hankison had just been reprimanded by his sergeant. He was assigned to a specific detail that day and wasn't supposed to be making arrests at all. While complaining to his partner about the interaction, he can be heard talking about seizing $25,000, far more than Hankison handed into the property room and in line with what Jackson says he had. I said, Sarge, I'm trying to do my job and you're making it really difficult right now. Are you guys busy? He said, no, we haven't had any. So, yeah, well, it's either that or get $25,000. I don't know, or three guns. I don't know which, uh, which, which, which the, uh, the mayor, the chief, and the community would want us to do. The recordings also suggest that Hankson was fishing for reasons to charge Jackson with trafficking marijuana, despite evidence to the contrary. Detectives accused him of selling weed to a woman, but didn't find any on her. And they only recovered a tiny amount from his car, which even Hankison can be heard acknowledging. It was a fraud. Nickel, dime, sack of weed. That's all it was. I agree. What you're saying, I'm worried with. The only witness, the cab driver, also independently corroborated Jackson's entire story. If he's over at the door, what kind of transaction took place between them two? Nothing. Mm. Damn, dude, I swear to God, I'd take a lie detector. Just talking Damn. or what? Yeah, they were just talking. He was trying to help the girl. He said, baby, I'll, I'll help you out. I understand she was telling me she got evicted, ain't got nowhere to go. But Hankison still sent two officers to Jackson's place, where they claim to have found more weed. On the inventory form that's filled out, it says 10 grams of weed. What? Uh, in total, which I think- I've never seen that. No. Jackson says he never gave them permission to search his home, and no record of anyone giving consent exists. Even if police did find 10 grams of weed during a legal search, that amount still isn't nearly enough to suggest he was trafficking. In the weeks after his arrest, Jackson says other officers started harassing him, stopping and searching his car for no reason. When Hankinson pulled me over at Thornton's, all this stuff started happening right after. I mean, I've never been pulled over like that in my life. There was always unmarked cars, a Viper unit. They was watching me, trying to solidify the case for me as being a drug dealer, you know, to, so if they catch me doing something, they could keep all the money. And Hankison's influence seems to have continued behind the scenes in the courtroom. When the prosecutor was given the option to try Jackson's case as a misdemeanor or pursue a felony instead, he appeared to go call Hankison. Um, you want to take a few minutes and talk to your yeah, officer? Yeah, let me do that. And then went with the more serious charge, even though it meant dropping the case and starting all over again in a higher court. I'm showing the county is moving to dismiss. The county is planning on taking a direct on these. Yeah, my client come Absolutely, come on up. This is Michael Jackson. Mr. Jackson is quite um, upset. He believes that um, these charges are not fundamentally sound in any regard, uh, that the police had no reason to encounter him. The Commonwealth Attorney's Office told us that it isn't uncommon to take a direct indictment in circuit court as they did in Jackson's case. 
They denied any knowledge of police officers having undue influence in courtroom decisions. But a source with direct knowledge told us that Hankison was known for meddling with criminal cases and had a reputation for retaliating against people he'd arrested. I'm pretty adamant about not dismissing my cases or amending them down to misdemeanors when they're decent. The following year, as part of a separate internal investigation into Hankison, he told investigators he tried to personally get a woman's probation revoked. I'm the one who called Floyd County Commonwealth Attorney's Office myself. I took it upon myself to call uh, them, talk to the prosecutor. I sent him a copy of the citation. I sent him a copy of the lab results. I've tried to get her revoked. Jackson's second case went on for months, but was eventually dropped as well for lack of evidence. A after your case is dismissed, what, what happens? Do you get your stuff back? Except $10,180. They returned to me $14,010. Um, but it was still $10,180 short. PIU closed Jackson's case about the missing money because it found there was not enough evidence to prove a crime. But the department never opened a follow-up investigation into any potential policy violations by officers. When there is a discrepancy like this, what recourse does someone have to get that money back? Or to even just make it known that the money disappeared? I don't think there is a recourse. Of course I'm gonna get a no. You know, you're a fucking dope dealer. That money wasn't there. Go fuck yourself. Get on the ground, now! What it is, it's a burglary first. When the officers take the money from people, they're armed and they go in their house. I mean, I thought about that a long time ago, that it's, it's actually a home invasion. And it's Louisville's biggest gang. There's, there's no gang in Louisville bigger than the Louisville Metro Police Department. Short, 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 short. Most of these cases never got much attention. But even when the public is watching, LMPD has still failed to fully investigate suspicious behavior by its officers. The most high profile of all of these narcotics raids was the one that ended in Breonna Taylor's death. The public narrative was that no drugs or money were found at her apartment. But that's not what Detective Weedo's informant says he was told the following day. When did you become aware of, of that raid? The day after is when I became aware of it. I, like, I didn't watch the news or anything. I was getting paid for a buy. And I'm sitting in their car, I'm in the back seat. We know was in the passenger seat, and then I'm asking what we're gonna be doing next to get, you know, so I can make more money. And they said, things are gonna be on the, like, slowdown for a while now after what happened with the Breonna Taylor stuff. Weedo wasn't at Taylor's apartment on the night of the raid, but several members of his small narcotics unit were including Brett Hankison, who fired 10 shots that night. Who is talking during this? Who's telling you stuff? We know it's the one that's talking the whole time. He goes in to tell me that they couldn't really search the house too much, but they did search the bedroom, and under the mattress they found $15,000 in cash. Did you ask them what happened to the $15,000? No, nope, we didn't. Because I didn't know if they turned it in or not. A source close to Taylor confirmed that it was common for her to hold large amounts of cash at the apartment. And this isn't the first time we've heard about the potential presence of money. On a phone call made from jail about 12 hours after the raid, Taylor's ex, Jamarcus Glover, is recorded saying that Taylor had $14,000 of his money. All right, look, 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 tell your cousin, she, I don't know how, how I'm gonna make no shit up with Brie had goddamn like routine. She had an eight, I gave her the other day, and she picked up, she picked up another six. This recording was specifically cited by LMPD detectives in an internal report compiled months after the raid. Even though LMPD acknowledged there might have been money on the scene, no effort was ever made to find out what happened to it. In the hours after the raid, several members of Weedo's unit either lied or withheld information about their whereabouts. Luke Fawn, who is the head of the unit, took over the crime scene after SWAT cleared the apartment, told investigators two very different stories about when he left the scene. How long did you stay on scene after, you know, SWAT was done and then 
About 30 minutes, but I had, I, I had to head back down to the hospital with Matt Allen. How long were you there on Springfield? Several hours. Matter of fact, I was there till um, Professor, no, oh, actually, until PIU got there. So I would assume three hours they got there. And then once they got there, I was. Uh, went down to the hospital to see Madeline. Cole Gibson, Weedo's partner at the time, told investigators that he went home after leaving the scene. So after you left around four-ish, three or four, did you go home or go back station or? No, no. But key card data obtained by Vice News shows that he actually went to the office. Hankison, who was seen walking in and out of the crime scene, told investigators that he went directly to the hospital after leaving the scene. But cell phone records obtained by Vice News and analyzed by a telecommunications expert suggest he took an unusual detour. After initially heading northeast along the road to the hospital, his phone pinged a tower corresponding to location well south of the route. The trip took him approximately 30 minutes, almost twice as long as it should have. Another officer noted a similar delay on his way from the hospital to PIU. Um, after I spoke to Detective Hankinson, I left uh, um, U of L and went to our public integrity unit. Was Detective Hankinson there by that time? No. Do you know approximately how much later it was that he arrived? Uh, it was after me. I'm not sure uh, the, the time frame, um, but I do know it wasn't. Uh, the time it would take you to get from UL, there was a delay. Hankson arrived at PIU sometime before 3.42 a.m., when department records show he handed in his weapon. Investigators never tried to find out where Hankison might have gone other than the hospital. The Attorney General's office, as part of its own investigation, did question some officers who Hankison spoke with in the aftermath of the raid. But no one seemed to notice one of the oddest interactions contained in Hankison's phone records. During the period in which he was unaccounted for, Hankison exchanged multiple text messages with Detective Mike Kuzma, who worked for the nearby Shively Police Department. Kuzma played a small role in the investigation leading up to the raid, but in interviews with investigators, claimed to have no further knowledge or involvement. Kuzma's phone records, which were also obtained by Vice News, show that he was in Louisville right around the time the two were exchanging messages, even though he wasn't working and lives half an hour away. We don't know exactly what transpired, or even what the two were texting about, because no one ever subpoenaed Hankison's texts, and Kuzma was never asked about his contact with Hankison that night. Over the course of three investigations, two by LMPD and one by the state's attorney general's office, no one ever got answers about whether there was money at the apartment, if it was stolen, and if so, by whom. Given the history of allegations against LMPD for missing money, it raises serious questions about whether the now infamous raid was also part of the pattern we've identified in our reporting. For the past year, the Department of Justice has been investigating potential civil rights abuses at LMPD, including in how they conduct searches and seizures, and in what happened the night Taylor died. Have you done any informant work since then? No. They said, I just want you to know, it's not going to be like it used to be. We have to follow protocols, and it's going to be really tough to get these things done. Detective Weedo has been on administrative leave since July of 2020, when LMPD opened an investigation into an incident in which he shot a protester in the face with a pepper ball. We reached out to officers Weedo, Kuzma, Fawn, Gibson, and King, and none of them responded. Brian Bailey resigned from the department amid sexual misconduct allegations. His lawyer declined to comment, citing ongoing litigation. Brett Hankison was fired for his involvement in Taylor's death. When asked for comment on his whereabouts the night of Breonna Taylor's death, as well as the allegations relating to Mike Jackson's case, Hankison pointed out that most or all of what we asked about had been investigated by LMPD and was closed without findings of wrongdoing. LMPD's Criminal Interdiction Unit has since announced a shift away from narcotics work to a new focus on violent crime. Drug raids have decreased dramatically, from at least once a week to once every several months. 
We're not doing drugs for the sake of drugs. We're not doing warrants for the sake of warrants. On LMPD's new podcast, which they claim was launched to bring more transparency to the department, they recently made light of the idea of targeting people over small amounts of drugs. So these are your guys, for example, they're out finding the dime bags of weed, right? And they're making Absolutely those good not. weed arrests, no, right? No, no, and no. just taking care of the community one dime bag at a time. Is that what your guys are doing? That's what you're telling me? Couldn't be further from that, no. But for those who have experienced what happens when the cameras are off, it's going to take a lot more to rebuild trust. And so far, there have been no consequences or even acknowledgement of the damage the department's narcotics unit has already done. Internal friends are supposed to be the police over the police to ensure that I get justice. And with no justice, every time I see the police, even to this day, I'm scared. You were sober for almost 10 years leading up to Over that, 10 years. Leading up to that day? Over 10 years. See my smile? When I relapsed, it was because of that. I didn't do anything wrong, and no one believed me. No one believed me. I'm in rehab again. And uh, I have a room there, and I'm in recovery. I'm in that program there, and uh, um, everything's good now. What are you thinking about? God is good, man. You know, I mean, I lived through it. I lived through it. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.